one of those, um, I've been very pleased to meet Ralph Rosado recently because um, there are a number of people who are new to this topic in town. Pat, you don't count. <laughs> um, but I think those of us who've addressed it in the past really look forward to your energies being applied to it. Um, Ralph uh, has run a mid-sized real estate development firm um, which has created single family, multi-family, um, homes, retail office, and mixed use projects. He currently serves as the executive director of the South Florida Community Development Coalition and is completing a doctorate in city planning from the University of Pennsylvania. So um, here's another good example of how we might put academia and reality together um, for South Florida's benefit. Um, he's going to be focusing on affordable housing policy and neighborhood revitalization strategies at Penn, as well as here. Um, and so he's uniquely positioned to guide a discussion of South Florida's needs and solutions. Um, he will introduce the individual members of the panel. Please welcome Ralph. Thank you, Dean Plater Zyberg. Um, as she said, my name is Ralph Rosado. I'm executive director for the South Florida CDC, which is the local community development coalition that um, tries to bring together groups that are focused on affordable housing and or economic development countywide. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here today. And in large part, that's because uh, many years ago when I was uh, getting my master's, I actually had the good luck to be uh, a White House intern. And I was able to uh, intern with the White House as well as at HUD under then Secretary Mel Martinez. So this has sort of come full circle for me, which is very nice. I'm also very pleased to be here today because you've got some of the top thinkers and doers in the field of workforce housing uh, all you know, brought together in one room. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce each of them. Um, they're gonna let you know uh, uh, everything that they do, which uh, you'll notice is, is quite substantial and has a, a broad range in terms of their skill sets, abilities, and their geographic reach. To my immediate uh, right, you have Mario Ortegona. Mario is the CEO of Habitat for Humanity uh, for Greater Miami. Now, Habitat, as you all know, is an international nonprofit that builds um, all over the world, and it's one of the largest builders of homes uh, for single family, uh, uh, low income uh, families that are trying to get into their first homes. Uh, the current focus here locally is Liberty City. By next summer, they will have completed over 200 homes in this neighborhood that is uh, in great need uh, of new families moving in. To his right, you have Stephanie Berman Eisenberg. Uh, Stephanie is president of CAR4 Supportive Housing. CAR4 is a not-for-profit that was established in 1993 by the Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce as a way to help families transitioning out of homelessness. Um, they've been able to uh, develop over 1,000 units throughout the county in some very creative uh, ways that I hope that she'll elaborate upon. To her right, you have Matt Greer, CEO of Carlisle Development Group. That's actually one of the largest affordable housing builders in the nation um, with regard to tax credit projects. They've completed over 80 projects locally or have that many underway. Um, and these are uh, projects that include uh, LEED certified buildings as well as transit oriented development, mixed income projects, historic rehab, um, and a, num another, uh, a number of other creative uh, building types. To his right, you have Al Milo Jr., who is Principal and Senior Vice President of uh, Related Urban Development Group. Now, this group is one of the more recent groups developed to, de to essentially construct or acquire affordable and workforce housing. Al is the former president of the Builders Association of South Florida, as well as their Builder of the Year. To his right, you have Arden Schenk. Arden is the president of my board, and he's also the president and CEO of Neighborhood Housing Services of South Florida. Uh, NHS SF, as it's uh, referred to, has six lines of business, so they're very diversified. And these include home buyer preparation, lending, housing development, real estate sales, neighborhood revitalization more broadly, and foreclosure prevention. Arden currently leads the six agency consortium uh, that was funded through stimulus dollars three years ago and tasked with building 1,200 uh, units or renovating as many throughout Miami-Dade County. And they're actually on track not only to meet that goal but exceed it by several hundred units uh, within the next few months. And finally, you have Jim Murley. And Jim Murley comes to this with a uh, different perspective. 
Jim is currently Executive Director of the South Florida Regional Planning Council. He's a former uh, Secretary of the Department of Community Affairs under Governor Lawton Childs, and as uh, the current head of the Regional Planning Council, Jim is tasked with overseeing what's called 750, which I, I've asked him to explain, because I think everybody in this room really has a role with the 750 plan. And the idea is that they uh, have combined the Regional Planning Councils within the, the South Florida and, and uh, uh, Palm Beach area, and they're trying to create a plan that covers seven counties, so essentially all of Southeast Florida, for the next 50 years. This includes a number of initiatives such as economic development, preservation of the environment, transportation coordination, and uh, for those of us here in the room today, housing. So we hope everybody will get involved in that. Um, they're all doing exemplary work in their field, so what I'd like to do is I've posed some questions to them which I think will allow them the opportunity to tell you about the kinds of creative and uh, interesting and really productive and powerful things that they're doing in South Florida. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, Executive Director Fortner referred to one definition of workforce housing this morning, but as we know, it's a term that's uh, you know, used quite frequently, but there's not exactly consensus as to what it means. Um, some will tell you that the term developed as a sort of marketing strategy to focus on the fact that a lot of folks that already are working need homes, um, and others will tell you that it's really based on income targets that are maybe higher than folks that would need affordable housing. So workforce housing may be for folks at a higher end of that stratum. How, did, how do you define it um, as an organization and tell us about your efforts to get it built in South Florida? Great. Uh, <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. I guess I have the distinction of going first, <laughs> alphabetical and by grade. Um, um, workforce housing, you know, it's really, it, it, it's a, um, it's an, yeah, you always have to start with a joke. Um, it's an interesting tag because frankly, uh, there is no real definition that I have been able to, to find. It goes from anywhere, you know, let's just say you go to a public hearing and you're trying to get an affordable housing project put uh, in a community. If you call it an affordable housing project, the people will come out and uh, the same folks uh, will see the recipients as, you know, underserving moochers that are going to get something for nothing. You call it workforce housing and they're deserving nurses and cops. Same audience, same. So I do think that it's a marketing, it's a marketing strategy uh, and one that's been very, very effective. Now technically, uh, what Habitat does is build for low income housing and that is at a, at a much lower um, income scale than what workforce housing is. We are well below the average median income. So wouldn't really consider us a workforce housing by that definition, although every single Habitat homeowner to qualify has to have a job. They have to work. We build for the working poor. So I guess, you know, contradicting myself, so it is workforce housing, but it's just not the definition that, that, that uh, you know, that they use in, in marketing and so on. So, you know, we really focus uh, uh, on first-time home buyers that have a very hard time getting the traditional uh, you know, loans or, or, or really who qualify for homes uh, on programs that are, that are not Habitat. It's a remarkably effective program. We have in Dade County alone built close to 950 homes. And a testament on how it works is that since Habitat's inception in South Florida, of those 950 homes, all of which are sold to our homeowners who, by the way, work extremely long sweat equity hours, a minimum of 300 hours, there have been nine foreclosures in 27 years. Nine out of 950. Uh, I challenge any bank in America <laughs> to come up with those numbers. So, so it's a real testament that um, there are a lot of working poor out there that just need a little push to break that cycle of poverty. And, you know, we're very proud that Habitat provides that. Uh, you know, there's misconceptions that we give away our homes and stuff. I'll bring 950 families who will beg to differ uh, <laughs> because it's a long and difficult journey. So I don't really know if, uh, if I've answered your questions. I like the sound of my voice, so I just sort of <laughs> ramble. Uh, but, but, you know, but we are proud. And, you know, I'm, I, I joke, but Habitat is serious business. And, uh, and we're very proud that it, that it works and that it targets the working poor. And let me stress, uh, 
I think there is no substitute for home ownership uh, when it comes to affordable housing. If someone qualifies for home ownership, that should be the way to go. And I, you know, challenge our uh, sponsors and I challenge our local governments to try to put re-emphasize on ownership because it's not just that family that's benefiting. That is the true key to economic development. That's how you see communities build. That's how you see children's grades go up. And we have the proof that that is the case. And we're, you know, we'll shout it from any mountaintop for anyone who's willing to listen. So thank you and we'll, you know, I'll let someone else. As we move down the road, please definitely answer what I asked, but if you could also piggyback on that. <laughs> No, 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 I don't, I, I yes, say Mr. that also. Lerner. Yes, no. Mr. Lerner, yes, Mr. Lerner. I say that also because Mario's last comment is, is a, sort of a different model than what some of you are, are building, so I, I'd love to hear those thoughts. You can moderate the next debate. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon. I, I agree with Mario. Um, I think especially in the, in the last couple of years, the term workforce housing has definitely been more of a, a marketing strategy to make the type of housing that we build um, more acceptable to the communities when, when we try to develop something. Um, we don't use the term affordable housing or workforce housing in defining what we do as two different types of housing. Um, we develop two different types of housing at Carrefour. One is to serve families that were formerly homeless and extremely low income, many of whom are working poor, um, minimum wage jobs. And then we also build affordable housing, which is for folks that we consider able to pay closer to market rent rents, um, but not quite there yet. Um, so those are the distinctions that we make. And within the extremely low income homeless units, we charge 30% of a household's income as rent. So that really makes it very manageable for, for a low income family. So if someone's income is disability, for example, if that's their only source of income, then they only have to pay 30% of that to live in one of our homeless housing units. <coughs> and that really leads to the residential stability for them and allows them to start planting the seeds to really start turning their lives around because the rent is manageable. They don't have to worry about housing being an obstacle. Um, in the affordable housing that we develop, um, homelessness isn't a requirement, um, but we try to target a wide variety of incomes in our affordable housing, from very low income households to what is more is typically considered workforce housing, which is families earning at least 60% of the area median income. And I think what's unique about what Carrefour does is that we kind of blend it all together into one building. So you'll walk into one of our um, high-rise buildings and you'll kind of just see everyone coexisting there, the formerly homeless family with the single formerly homeless veteran with our workforce um, housing household, all just living together. No one really identifies as a particular demographic and no one knows who's living in which type of unit and it works really well. I, when people walk in and they ask us that question, every, all these folks are living in here? We say, yeah, and, and no one would ever know. It's really just attached to a type of funding source that funded that particular unit. Um, but it really does amazing things for all of the families living in there. For the low-income families, it's, um, it's wonderful to see families getting up in the morning and going to work and, and being productive, and it really serves as, as a motivator. And for, other, for the workforce housing families, you know, we've had some families that kind of form a mentoring relationship with some of our low-income families. Um, and it really works well, the blending, and that's, that's the type of housing that Carrefour um, really tries hard to encourage within the community. That's great. Hard to follow these two, I'll tell you. Um, I will try to offer you um, the, how we look at it internally, um, because I think there are three good ways to look at, at, at this question of um, what is affordable versus workforce housing. Um, I think there's the, the marketing aspect that Mario hit on, which is exactly right. Different communities have very different appetites um, for affordable housing, and unfortunately many of them have um, suffered through affordable housing that they didn't feel was uh, additive to their community and to their you know, experience of living in that neighborhood, and we all deal with that every day. Um, there's the sort of what I'll call the, the technical term, which is AMI, the area median income, and people tranche up you know, you know, members of a community from 0% of median income to, you know, I think 140%, you know, no one's really looking too much above that. Um, and then internally, we look at it um, in terms of what sources are required in order to make a deal happen. And there's really kind of three um, tranches the way I would think of it. There's, there's deals that work um, without subsidy. There's deals that work with the low-income housing tax credit, which, you know, lest we kid ourselves, is basically the provider of affordable housing, whether it's, you know, except for, I'd say, what Mario is doing, which is unique and fantastic. Um, 
and absolutely necessary and, and absolutely a great part of any community's mix of affordable housing. Most other forms of development are, are reliant in some form or other on the low income housing tax credit. Uh, and, and when it goes away, and I, I say it's more likely when than if, um, you know, we will all have to really wrestle with the question of what happens that can fill that gap. But um, so you have projects that work without the low income housing tax credit, projects that work with only the low income housing tax credit, and projects that work with the low income housing tax credit and other usually ongoing sources. I think like the one Stephanie is referring to where we're trying to serve people either in a, in, um, a, a very low income bracket or we're trying to accomplish other really fantastic goals other than simply housing people within a certain AMI range. Um, and, uh, and I think the real question for a lot of us has been where the demand is in our, in, our, in our difficult to develop urban areas, more and more what you're finding is the projects that only require a low income housing tax credit are going away. And what do you do when you know, those other su funding sources, whether they're surtax or whether they're sale loan or whether they're uh, HUD dollars are also not there? And, and how do we as a community reach beyond our traditional borders to try to tap into sources that don't that don't gore anyone else's ox, to put it bluntly, that, that aren't fighting for a, a limited uh, pool of resources. And I think you know one good example we've tried very hard to work with um, housing authorities that have a limited pool of funds and to try to stretch their funds further. Uh, we have developed in, in in the last six years in Fort Lauderdale. We've redone 50 acres of downtown Fort Lauderdale. It's kind of this secret that that is about to to really hit with our last development. Um, 80 acres in total of Fort Lauderdale have been redone through uh, low-income housing tax credit partnerships with housing authorities. Another good opportunity that I think Al can speak to as well is transit-oriented projects that, that um, utilize the funds and the land and the access to rail that the transit agencies have and try to put those uh, land to work as more than simply a, a parking lot. Um, these are just a few strategies, but I think all of us will ultimately have to wrestle with you know, how big a role the low-income housing tax credit has come to play in the American housing landscape, and what are we going to do when we have a credit that I think, if I was listening, maybe I was, you know, listening a little too closely, but I think uh, Governor Romney last night basically specifically singled out the tax credit as something he will get rid of in order to supposedly balance the seven trillion. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and there's no question that's on a lot of people's mind. Democrat and Republican, you know, the entire center of this country feels that it gets no benefit from this program. Um, there, there's, there's, there, there are a number of stumbling blocks that we will have to address, but the way we look at it internally is, do you need the credit, and if you need the credit, do you need the credit in something else, or can it work on its own? Good afternoon. Um, I, I guess the, the technical definition of, you know, of workforce is, um, from, I guess, from a regulatory standpoint is, starts at 61% of AMI going upwards of, up to 140% uh, is, is, is your technical uh, definition. But uh, as Matt says, the, the, the issue is how do you produce housing for that broad spectrum of income? Because there's a big difference between families at 60% or families at a lower scale, uh, as Stephanie and, and, and Mara mentioned, in the um, Habitat for Humanity model or the Carrefour model is different than even the working class families that are trying to get into a tax credit uh, project. Um, you heard Mr. Fortner say that a lot of his residents, which are public housing, which is usually deemed as folks that are either on fixed incomes or that don't work. You know, that's the perception. Um, and, and you heard him say that a big percentage of his residents are actually working. They have earned income in addition to maybe some uh, disability income or, or fixed income uh, from the federal government. So the, the, the you know, and, and, and I see a lot of faces that I've known for many years I mean, uh, in the audience, you know, Fannie Mae in, 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 in City of Miami, different developments. and. I, we've been able to provide, and, and previously under Urban Development Group, we had a lot of incentives and, and a lot of programs where we were providing housing to that workforce, which was predominantly home ownership uh, product. Um, and there were programs in place, uh, you know, Miami-Dade County, the City of Miami, Fannie Mae, uh, at the time, uh, HUD. There were there were programs to incentivize home ownership housing for that 
family that was traditionally not being served in the tax credit uh, housing arena, which is, stops at 60% because of the regulations. So there, the, the, there was that opportunity to provide that type of housing. What happened obviously is during the, 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 the housing boom, that product started to get more and more expensive. I mean, it was a time where an affordable housing cutoff price at the county was 225,000, at the city was 236,000, you know? So that got to a point where it was no longer affordable, even for that workforce housing. Uh, and I see Pat shaking her head, you know, on the bond program, I think it got up to scratching 400,000 at one time where it was eligible as a, as, as a, to get a first mortgage on, on a bond loan, uh, on a single family bond loan. So the, the, housing, um, the housing boom certainly created a problem for this workforce housing uh, clientele that was traditionally thought of as your nurses, your teachers, your police officers, and so forth. Um, and now you see the reverse effect, which is, yes, the product is, is much more uh, affordable now you you don't you don't have to sell product at, at necessarily at that price but you have a diff now you have the adverse problem now you can't get a loan for those workforce housing families if you're going to try to serve them in a home ownership scenario so the house is more affordable but now you can't you can't obtain a mortgage um, in addition the the pricing and 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 the 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 development side of it is the challenges that were there originally are still there today. Yes, you may be able to buy land a little cheaper and you may be able to build your product a little less expensive, but it's, 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 it's relative because it's not that much less expensive in, in proportion to what the incomes of that workforce is because we've all seen the incomes over the last four years are basically stagnant. So yes, I mean, you had an increase of 120, 130% in costs, They've adjusted down 30, 40, 50 percent, depending who you ask. There's still a big difference there, and and that difference is 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 going to have to be. Um, it's a challenge. It's a challenge if you're gonna if you're gonna serve your your workforce on a for sale product. On the rental product, it's like Matt says. The only real financing strategy there to serve, you know, working individuals, and is the tax credit program. And the tax credit program has to stop at 60% of AMI. So there again, you have, um, you have this break between what's deemed affordable housing from a regulatory standpoint and what you can um, fund. How do you deal with somebody that's at 61%? How do you deal with someone that's at 80% of AMI? 80% from a HUD perspective is low income. Well, but from a tax credit perspective, they're over the chart. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are the, the real problems that I think, you know, we have to uh, come together and try to figure out. You know, there are programs in place from HUD perspective, but usually the local governments, like traditionally home funds, are not used, you know, for 80% of AMI housing. They're traditionally, they're used for 60% or 50% of AMI housing. So there's a lot of different regulatory uh, challenges to, to produce, you know, work, workforce housing in, in, in this environment. Pardon? Neighborhood Housing Services is the lead agency in the Neighborhood Stabilization Program Round 2 consortium here in Miami-Dade. And uh, in, that, uh, in that world, anything under 120% of AMI fits the category. Um, and maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll comment since it's a, a major thing that our partners, of course, Stephanie at CAR4, Al's a, a developer partner with Little Haiti Housing, Stephanie out here with Opalaka CDC, and, and, and others of us are focused on getting $90 million spent before February 11 of 2013. And um, different than most HUD programs in the past, there is a very clear and definite deadline that Congress imposed, and uh, so the work needs to be done. Uh, as Ralph mentioned in the introductory comments, we, we, it looks like we're going to exceed the, our, our unit count that we were required to meet, which was 1,255. We're, we're, we are well on the way to 15 to 1,600. It depends on how things work out here over the last uh, four months. Um, 
so, so a couple other comments in terms of affordability, and you know, we we do work across Miami-Dade and Broward in, in the other things that we do. Uh, the 3,500 families we've worked with in two years on foreclosure prevention, uh, it's a different kind of affordability when the value of your house keeps decreasing. Um, and you, you thought you owned something, but now you don't. Uh, so, so for that, the, the affordability is, uh, you know, the job and can I make the payment? And then we've also worked with over 4,000 families in two years in home buyer training. So in terms of our market, we have two opposite things going on at the same time. There are still people losing their homes every day in South Florida because of foreclosure. But at the same time, and, the, and I see several of you out there that also do home buyer preparation, there is a massive demand for, for buying. Prices are lower than, what, 15 years? and interest rates are lower than ever, but as Al mentioned, it's a challenge getting the mortgage. So that, that piece we're working on now with our lender partners to come up with ways to overcome that challenge. Well, now, Ralph, I understand why I'm last. <laughs> um, when I looked at the panel and called Ralph a couple of days ago, I said, you know, I don't think I, this is the right conference. Uh, You're in the right place. And I, and I just learned a lot, uh, listening as, as I'm sure you did, although I know many of you in the audience uh, deal with these issues every day. This does remind me of, of <coughs> several decades ago when I was Department of Community Affairs Secretary. That was the former Department of Community Affairs. Uh, and, and in that position, we served on the Housing Finance Authority, and I had the privilege of helping that become the independent corporation. But this was indeed the kinds of issues we dealt with. And the world was very different. Uh, that was, what, 10, 15 years ago uh, for the providers, that, that the business people here that are here, and gosh, it was quite different five years ago, which is probably the reason uh, that we have planning organizations like the South Florida Regional Planning Council who try to understand uh, that we don't always uh, realize the changes that can occur, the trends that are happening, uh, the scenarios that we need to be looking at as we go out 5, 10, or even 50 years. So our organization, the South Florida Regional Planning Council, which we've been around for uh, over 30 plus years, um, it includes uh, Miami-Dade County, Monroe, and Broward. So that's sort of the home region uh, for the work that happens uh, in Southeast Florida. But our position, uh, having like you experienced the last five years of uh, change in, in all aspects of our community, was that we needed to look at a larger geographic area for a longer amount of time uh, through the eyes and understanding of, of a bunch of diverse interests in this region. And so we took the opportunity to apply to uh, uh, Housing and Urban Development, a HUD agency that is so important at the housing delivery level. Uh, they were also had, the, had presented grant opportunity program to do regional sustainable uh, planning. And I know Armando's here and, and his, his office working with Washington office uh, put together a really creative program, a competitive program for regions around the country. We put together the Southeast Florida Regional Partnership, which allowed us to work with not only our three counties, but the four counties uh, in the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council, uh, Palm Beach up to Indian River. So from a geography standpoint, Greg was talking about how big Miami-Dade County is, and it is big. But we're looking at an area from Vero Beach to Key West, uh, 200 uh, miles of coastline, longer than the coastline of New Jersey, and a population of about 6 million currently, which makes it larger than 35 states. So it is an active region with a great variety of housing issues going on, a great variety of economic activity, transportation, environment and water. And it's in that context that the housing issues uh, of this work uh, and this project uh, are being undertaken. In addition to having the a partnership with the Regional Planning Council, uh, we have a, a, a working relationship with some excellent consultants. Elizabeth, Pl Elizabeth Plater Zyberg is one of our lead consultants. Jim Karras is here who helps us on our housing issues. Uh, the staffs at both the Regional Planning Councils 
uh, especially Eliz uh, uh, my, my staff member, uh, uh, Isabel Casillo Caballo, is, Isabel, uh, is, is the heart and soul of the work we do. So how does it relate to and uh, how, how can it give you some context for the, the immediate issues uh, that these gentlemen and, and, uh, and women are dealing with? Uh, we, with HUD, uh, understand that we've got to look at, at the housing issue in a more holistic way. We have to understand how the future demographics are going to operate, how the placement of housing today and in the future will relate to the investments we need to make in our transportation system, how the education institutions will be placed relevant uh, to housing, uh, where we have new uh, research institutes that need housing that we don't have today? How do we take advantage of the existing housing stock uh, as we move forward? Uh, in that region, we've got about uh, 1.5 million um, owner-occupied housing units and about 750,000 renter-occupied. So it's a huge uh, existing inventory that will turn over uh, and will be added to as our population grows. And we expect it to grow much in the ways it has in the last several years. We've prepared, uh, are in the process of completing a fair housing and equity assessment of that seven county area. Uh, some valuable information uh, that Jim Karras especially was helpful in putting, helping us put together. And we looked at the area, uh, mapped it uh, using ge geographic information systems and looked at the opportunity available for housing and, and uh, economic development and transportation opportunities uh, for especially uh, the population uh, uh, groups within our community and the ones that we saw from the trend lines that we would have to deal with, you know, they, the most challenged, where would they have the opportunity geographically? Where would, it, where would they have, uh, where would it be the best opportunities and where are there areas that we would call opportunity poor? And of course you intuitively know, I'm sure, where those areas are and much of our data proves out uh, the, the areas that we, that, that need that work today, they're probably going to need in, in the future. But there's some other areas that you might not have, we might not have thought about, uh, including the large uh, tens of thousands of citrus that are grown in the northern part of our region. Uh, the economy of that area is changing around, and that may be an area that, that um, grows and will need to deal with some of the urban issues that we know best in the South Florida. So it's a, it's a process that looks out 50 years. Uh, it has as its end goal uh, a regional investment plan that will uh, pick among many uh, variables some, uh, some big projects that we think as a region are needed to be invested in uh, so that we have housing for all uh, parts of our population, so that we have jobs and a transportation system uh, and a resilient communities in, in the face of the many uh, uh, storm events and other uh, things that occur. So it's. Uh, it's a context within which uh, these professionals do their work, uh, and, and I hope that it'll influence uh, future policies as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you all. So you've given us a lot to think about with regard to context, uh, especially with regard to product types and the different constituencies that you serve, which are obviously uh, in many cases different from each other. What I'd like to see, though, is if there are some commonalities in terms of challenges that go straight across the, the different entities. What's your single biggest professional challenge and how do you try to overcome it? Are we going alphabetical again? <laughs> um, um, I'm sure there's, there's gonna be a common thread and, and that's resources. Uh, in the case of Habitat specifically, um, we have great demand. We have lots of partner families that are, that are trying to, to uh, enter the program. Uh, we create volunteer opportunities, and it was funny, I was talking yesterday that um, one of the biggest problems we face is that we have more volunteers than we can deal with. We don't have enough resources to build as many houses as we have people willing to live in them or do so, or, or, or help build. So um, our, our biggest problem is by far uh, having the resources to build, uh, to build the homes and also um, costs. Um, you know, we, we put out a, an affordable product, um, you know, this, to anyone who works in the for-profit world, these things don't make sense, but we lose money on every single house that we build. It costs us more than we can sell them for. The nature of Habitat is to really provide an affordable product. Uh, we charge, 
appraised value. And more often than not, unfortunately, it costs us more. So that requires us to work extremely hard in, uh, in raising money and finding um, resources to do what we can. In terms of the second half of your question is of how do we, um, how do we overcome this challenge? Well, we are, we just have to tell our story. Our st nothing like results to show that you know money is well spent if, it, if invested with us. So uh, <coughs> the biggest challenge that we have is to make everyone aware of our program, how wonderfully uh, effective it is, what a life changer it is for the families and the communities that we build in, and, um, and, and to um, appeal to that sense of this is a good investment. And you're not writing a check into the great void and hopefully it will cure disease or it will do something and you know, all those things are worthwhile. But you know, we live in a world of instant gratification. And with Habitat, you can knock on the door, you can meet the family, you can um, you go to the dedication, you can help build that house, you can meet the homeowner. It's a very tangible product. And so that coupled with um, you know, how effective it works financially uh, is, is, is our, be our, our best selling point. So give us money. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would agree with, with Mario. I think um, there's probably few not-for-profits out there that would tell you that dwindling resources and growing need isn't their number one challenge. I think years ago, Carrefour's biggest challenge was nimbyism. No one wanted one of our communities in their backyard, but over the last couple of years, as the faces of homelessness have changed and it's more families that just lost a job or more families whose home was just foreclosed or just evicted because the building they were living in went into foreclosure, it, it's, NIMBYism has become less of an issue. It's something that I think more of the, the population in South Florida um, has come in some touch with, whether it's a relative or someone they work with. So it's, it, the NIMBYism has really gone away and really what we struggle with now is, is resources primarily in when we're trying to, to start a development and purchasing land. Um, as a not-for-profit, it's very hard for us to compete with our for-profit <laughs> friends here <laughs> when, a, when a good we site, work together we work sometimes. together, we do, um, but it's a challenge. Um, when, when we see a site that, that we like, it's, we don't have a lot of cash in the bank that we can just go down and, and purchase it. So that's one of our biggest challenges when, we're, when we see a development where there's a big need, um, where we think it would be a viable development is really coming up with that seed money to, to start the development. Great. That's a great point. Just to keep it interesting, I'll, I'll sort of try to turn it to a different concern. Obviously, resources, I, I don't think anyone's going to tell you uh, are easy for anyone. But um, I think the biggest struggle, I just w um, took a fascinating tour of the favelas in one of the emerging countries in South America. And you see the unbelievable ingenuity and resourcefulness of people who, you know, if they don't build their house, they're not going to have anywhere to sleep. And um, certainly, that's, we're, we're you know, that's not our problem here. Um, but, but what we struggle with, I think, is often the opposite. We have um, silos and we have processes that are designed to protect um, these sources and make sure they get used appropriately. And those, those silos and those processes are created with the best of intentions. And oftentimes, we're, we're very needed at the time they were put into place. Um, and, and fiefdoms grow up around those silos and those resources. and. Um, in today's environment, which is just so different from the tax credit world, at least, that was in place when the program was created, you know, in 1986, uh, we have to do more to bring those different resources to the table and bring them together creatively. I mean, I think, I think HUD's doing a great job of that, Greg and, and Armando, and, and, and other folks are starting to really try to break down those walls, but it's very hard. I mean, you know, they, they don't have, you know, they don't have a chainsaw. They have maybe like an ice pick. You know, and and, and um, that I think is our biggest struggle. I think a lot more housing could get built. I was talking, you know, we did an interview downstairs, and and they were asking, you know, um, you know, how do you argue for more resources? I mean, I, I go up to Tallahassee all the time. I don't. I don't even bother to argue for more resources because their arguments about why they're not going to give us more resources are not only clearly already set in stone, but they're they're you know they're compelling. Where they talk about the gaps they're struggling with and the sources. <laughs> Uh, that they've lost in the last few years. It, it, it's not productive, really, you know, to spend a lot of time talking about what are we going to do in order to get the, the state surtax money back. Uh, you know, what I try to talk about is 
how can we bring you know, HUD more fully into the game and bring those resources to bear on, on really cutting edge projects? How can we bring small churches, you know, um, agencies of all kinds, partner with our nonprofit uh, you know, uh, colleagues and, and create more um, sources out of, out of what, you know, you might say create more sources out of what didn't appear to be sources originally. That's, that's the biggest struggle. People want to do the right thing. You know, we work with a lot of people in Miami-Dade County and, and they get such a bad rap. Um, you know, and sometimes deservedly, it's a big organization, but there's so many people that are trying very hard to do the right thing and they're just hamstrung by, you know, by the, the procedures and processes they use. I think, you know, I, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I think working with housing authorities all over the country, our housing authority here in town has a hard time because they're, they're commission controlled. They have, they have an additional set of struggles and hurdles and constituents they have to deal with that I don't have to deal with anywhere else in the entire country. And that's just one example of things that I think um, over time, if I had a magic wand, we would, we would get more housing built for lower cost if we could remove some of those unnecessary hurdles. Well, I mean, the, the easy answer obviously is that you need more money to produce more housing. I mean, that's a that's simple, simple response. But the reality is that there's not going to be a whole lot of additional resources um, regardless of what happens at the national level or the state level or the local level um, on, on, on the political side of the, of the equation, there's just not going to be additional resources or, or any large additional resources put into the programs. It's going to be a struggle to keep the resources that are there today in place. So um, I think that the the challenge for for organizations, nonprofit, for profit, um, is to find creative ways in which to produce the housing stock that's needed in the different spectrums of, of AMI with dwindling resources. Um, and and I would have to say that I, I would I agree 150 percent with what Matt said that. Probably, in my opinion, the biggest struggle is the regulatory barriers to produce the housing that we're trying to produce. And you've got, if you're dealing with federal funding, you, 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 you will get a, a funding agreement that has laws going back to 1960s, 1960s and everything there forward. And you're saying, well, we're going to need this money and we're going to give you this money to produce this housing. And you've got 17 pages of regulatory things you're asked to comply with. Some of which it's like, uh, well, you know, has anybody looked at this law in 40 years? You know, um, and. <laughs> and, and, and then that, that's the problem. You know, there, there, there probably was a time and a place for that regulation to have been implemented, but unfortunately, they just get put on the books, they stay on the books, they're never looked at again, but yet you're here in the now trying to produce housing. Right, and we're the liberal Democrats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's 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 that for sure is the biggest and 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 you know there we we could go on for for a day and a half just talking about regulatory obstacles that we have to deal with at all different levels of government um just from as simple as again a 40 year old hud law to as uh, to a you know, clearance for, from an environmental perspective to get a building permit, you know, um, where, where you're, you know, you're supposed to extend the water line, you know, 50 feet to serve your development and you have to deal with a regulatory agency that is asking you about your diesel tank at the, you know, at the project and it's like, well, we're not touching the diesel tank, we're talking about the water line, uh, but yet you have to wait a month to, to, to get that regulatory agency to approve your drawings, all the while that affects the feasibility of your development. And that, that to me is the biggest struggle that we have, regardless of the income spectrum that you're going to uh, try to serve. You know, there's, there's a major disconnect with the, with the work that we're trying to accomplish and the regulatory agencies that we need to deal with on a regular basis outside of the funding 
um, in order to accomplish that work and the time and the dollars and the aggravation that it costs in order to get you uh, to be able to produce that housing. So I would say that, you know, that's where really the think tanks and, you know, and, and people need to come together and try to find ways to streamline the process. I mean, we were talking earlier about, and, and, and we'll touch on that topic after, I guess, in, in the next question about working with PHAs. Well, PHAs have a great asset. These are, you know, housing authorities have land. They, they've got housing stock that, it, that is antiquated for the most part. They've had dwindling resources from the federal government, so the asset is there. But you go work with the PHA and they want to work with you and they want to get something done, but when you look at the regulatory framework in order to do a redevelopment deal with a PHA, most people are gonna run for cover. You know, it's, 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 it's a very daunting task and, and that's where I think groups like this and panels like this and, and, and conferences like this need to come together to find ways to streamline the regulatory barriers that we have to deal with on a regular basis. Actually, Al probably just didn't like the fact that my regulatory staff person required him to do certain things so I could keep Armando and his colleagues off my back, huh? <laughs> uh, it's an issue. I agree with the funding thing, definitely. Um, what I'm gonna comment on is, is a different aspect of this that does end up uh, talking about funding eventually. And that is particularly in our NSP2 census tracts, uh, we and our colleagues, uh, Opelaka CDC and Little Haiti Housing and NHS have done some of the single family, mo the single family work within that consortium. The, the issue that we've discovered is the, the, the amazingly poor quality of housing stock that we have in this county, particularly the older stuff. Now, all five of us here have all done new construction, single family and multifamily. And while there are plenty of issues to deal with, it still doesn't compare to doing the rehab. What, again, whether it's um, a multifamily or single family. There are so many single family houses and small multifamily buildings, particularly those say under 40 or 50 units, that simply need to be torn down. There are hundreds of thousands of those type of buildings. Um, so for example, in order for, and this is just us, this doesn't include uh, Opelaka CDC or Little Haiti Housing, just for us, we purchased 36 REO properties over the last uh, 18 months or so. In order to get that, we looked at 700 houses. And I don't mean we looked at them sitting in front of a, a computer screen. We were out there on the street. Yes. We eliminated so many. Now, some the, the the other kind of issue is that 60 to 65 percent of the the sales in the last year or two have been uh, international buyers paying cash. So that's a whole other issue. But just from the quality of housing, when we looked at the amount of time we had to get that rehab done, we simply couldn't take some of them on. Uh, what we even out of the 36, we ended up. Uh, we're, we're tearing down six of the houses and putting a new structure there. But the quality of housing is both the fact that they're smaller than what most families want now. They're a two bedroom, one bath. Uh, many of them don't, even, don't have a garage. And uh, so, so you have these outdated uh, footprint houses and a house that's 40 or 50 years old and has never had the roof replaced or the electric upgraded or the plumbing replaced how many of us want to live in that house? Well, and I know Danny, you know this, you've seen hundreds of these houses, they just need to go away. But how do you afford to do that? You know, the discussion about the regulatory issues I think is a good segue to the issues that we deal with as we look uh, out into the future. And, and I would define them as what I would call them as uh, fragmented government authority 
uh, in our current uh, regional setup. And those fragmented governmental authorities, I think, in many cases, lead to the, to the uh, overlapping regulations. And you have to look at it, I think, and understand it historically. Why, why are we this way? And again, I'm looking now at the larger geographic region that we occupy very large counties in geographic area, uh, inclusive of the environmental areas. Palm Beach County is the largest county in acreage, land area, east of the Mississippi River. And Miami-Dade and Broward and the other counties are, are very large. And 50 years ago, they could operate as independent units. They could create their own uh, housing finance agency or their own housing authority uh, or their own uh, almost of everything. But even the 2000 census said that those three counties had grown into one metropolitan statistical area. They, they, the commuting patterns in, of employees back and forth across those county lines had erased those borders. But in fact, regardless of the census data and other things, that w when you project those out 10, 15 years, it's even more integrated. But the fragmented government authority doesn't change. And the biggest thing that we lack because of that is we lack the clout for the size of the region and the amount of people and the economic activity. We just don't get our fair share in Tallahassee and Washington because we're not organized and we're fragmented. Uh, and that is going to be a consequence if you're looking for funding, if you're looking to change laws that impact the issues that we're talking about today. Uh, what we have as part of our 750 process, try to look at this both in the short range and the long range. Working with HUD, uh, they have said, look at this fair housing assessment. Can we do some things regionally and that will allow the, the applicants for the smaller projects to just be able to check that box off because we've got a regional fair housing assessment? Uh, if you apply today for a HUD grant, you can get a letter from Isabel that will give you two points in any competitive <laughs> grant process because you're in the region. So there are things going on already. <laughs> oh, your, your mailbox There's is Isabel. about to get filled up, Isabel. But long term, we've just got to be able to face the governmental fragmented authority. And it's not just in housing, it's also true in transportation and other areas. Uh, we've got to find a way to take those units, you don't have to give up all local prerogatives, uh, but we don't need, you know, 500 organizations with 500 health plans uh, or 500 people looking at the same census information. There's ways, especially in the long-range planning activities that feed into these projects, that we could be much more efficient if we attempt to do it more on the regional level. Thank you. That, Isabel, could you raise your hand? <laughs> That's Isabel. She'll be sticking around all day. She has letters ready so everybody can get their two points. Two Make points. sure to see her before you leave. <laughs> our, our panel is very humble but actually very innovative, and I'd like for you all to share uh, an example of one project that you were involved with that was particularly creative with regard to the building type or the placement or the neighborhood or the partnerships that you had to secure in order to get the project done. Um, well, I'm going to differ a little bit. Um, habitat, well, why now? Why stop now, right? Um, habitat, actually, one of the, I think, the keys to our success is keeping it simple. And we don't reinvent the wheel. Our program works. We build single-family homes. Uh, and um, we have found that, although we have had some success in small, multifamily units, um, our traditional homeowner wants the the dream of you know not sharing walls and having uh, a fenced yard and so on. So so we actually by design keep it simple. Um, so the partnerships that we create or will not create really take advantage of. We have a great partnership with uh, with the county, mm -hmm. and one way we have been able to reduce cost is by really uh, we jumped all over the infill housing program. The county has all these scattered lots all over. Uh, the community, we have focused on Liberty City, and we've gotten over 140 lots that were just abandoned um, eyesores that were costing the county lots of money to maintain. And we said, okay, well, we'll take them off your hands, and we'll deliver a product in 18 months. And so we've converted those uh, abandoned lots to, you know, home sites on the tax rolls, and it's one of those rare win-wins. Um, so, so I do see lots of, uh, of, of my colleagues up here that have some very creative programs, but by design, 
we try to keep it simple. I'm a firm believer in, in the Habitat philosophy is do fewer things right than spreading yourself too thin and doing a bunch of different things not as well. So uh, um, effective, yes. <laughs> Creative, eh, maybe not as much. <laughs> We're, we're on the opposite end. We like to do complicated. Yeah. So. And you do it well. <laughs> um, we have a, a couple of very creative partnerships that we finished over the last couple of years. Um, a couple of years back, we finished our Villa Aurora um, development, which is in Little Havana. And that, that building houses um, the only Hispanic public library um, in the county on the ground floor. Um, it has 76 units of housing, which is a combination of um, housing for formerly homeless families and um, affordable housing for low-income families and for workforce housing. So it's kind of a hodgepodge of a bunch of di different demographics living in the same building. And then the top floor are office spaces. Carfor's office is there. And we also have a couple other not-for-profits housed up on our 12th floor. And a, a really neat project that we just finished last year is our Verde Gardens project down in Homestead. Um, it's actually on the former Homestead Air Force Base. And that development has 145 units of housing, mostly for homeless families, but some affordable housing on there as well. Um, a 22-acre organic farm and a farmer's market with the idea of the folks living there really learning how to, how to farm and, and how to grow and then how to sell what they grow at the farmer's market. And that was a, a partnership between the county with the Homeless Trust and with um, PHCD and also with our farming partners, Earth Learning. And that's been an amazing, watching the evolution of that project has been amazing. Watching a family that just moved out of shelter um, get settled and get housed and then watching them working out on the farm and then seeing them on Friday, the day that the market's open, selling what they've grown and, and earning with whatever they sell, they, they take home the income from what they sell. Um, so that's been a, an amazing, amazing partnership to see evolve. Once again, not fun going after these two. Um, <laughs> I, I would not be doing my job if I did not plug uh, a partnership that I'm working on with the University of Miami School of Architecture and the Real Estate Development Program um, that we've hatched to, to try to bring uh, really innovative home ownership opportunities to the West Grove uh, in partnership with a consortium of churches and, and uh, some green design uh, prefab manufacturers that's still uh, in process, so I don't think it's smart to brag about something that hasn't been accomplished yet, but, um, but since University of Miami is playing such a big role there, I wanted to mention that. Um, you know, one of the things we talk about a lot internally is, you know, how do you actually make a dent? Um, you know, I think Mario sort of mentioned basically the Steve Jobs approach, you know, keep it simple and, you know, execute on what you do well, have one button in the center of the phone. Uh, I think that's very important, but Steve Jobs also talked a lot about really making a dent in the universe, and um, we have over a million severely rent burdened people in our, you know, in our MSA. And, and you know, this year we're going to deliver, if we're really lucky and we all really do our jobs and, and Al does well and I do well and Stephanie does well, we're going to really hope we're going to deliver 4,000 apartments um, for those million people. So that's the extent of, of what we're doing currently and I think it doesn't, it doesn't change the dynamic from a, from a housing point of view and, and more importantly to a lot of folks, it doesn't change the dynamic from an economic development point of view. It doesn't make Miami more competitive for businesses to relocate here. It doesn't keep my, you know, accountants who work for me from moving to Tennessee where they can get a house and have a, you know, a yard and a pool. And that's the key question, I think, for a lot of us is how do we make an impact in that imbalance? Um, so the project I'm most proud of uh, is, is uh, really a series of projects that we've undertaken with one partner, the Housing Authority in Fort Lauderdale. Um, who had to, you know, really rethink their rules, who had to rethink their process, who had to relook at their priorities. They started with a million and a half dollars, which it had taken them about 10 years to scrape together. So they had about $150,000 a year that they'd been able to salt away, maybe without HUD noticing, I don't know how they did it, um, to, to end up with a million and a half dollars. We've now done almost a quarter of a billion dollars of development with that one and a half million dollars. Um, they've rolled that money and rolled that money and rolled that money over successfully. We've created a huge urban garden in a very underserved area in the middle of their community, which has programming related to food deserts and cooking the food that you actually eat, you know, uh, growing the food that you actually cook rather than going and buying food. Um, and maybe most importantly, uh, it's given them the freedom, the space, and the cash flow to create a really incredible program, which I encourage you all to look into called Step Up, where the youth who live at the public housing development uh, get job training on how to build cabinetry and, and uh, furniture, which is then used in not only our affordable housing projects with them, but is now actually being sold to third party uh, developers. And it's, it's giving those kids a chance to get out of the public housing uh, um, 
uh, environment they grew up in with real marketable job skills. So from a million and a half dollars to a quarter billion dollars to me is, is the only way we start to make any sort of impact in the, in the supply demand curve that we're all facing here um, over the next 25 years. Um. <laughs> Go big or go home. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, there, there, you know, we, we've, when, when, when we formed, uh, you know, the, the related urban uh, division to, to, to go after additional uh, affordable and workforce housing um, projects, you know, we started and, and we've done, created several partnerships locally. I mean, we've got, I know we have, George Mensah here from the city of Miami, we did uh, some stuff with a uh, nonprofit partner in, in the city, NSP, uh, with their NSP1 and their NSP3. Um, we were able to leverage some of those funds with GOB dollars from Miami-Dade County and produce uh, elderly affordable housing for 35 and 45% of AMI um, elderly residents in, in Little Havana. Um, we've done with uh, NSP2, the consortium, we, uh, you know, Arden mentioned Little Haiti Housing. We, we, we did a redevelopment of a building that was out of service, 65 units. It was out five, four or five years out of service since Hurricane Wilma, I believe. We partnered with Little Haiti Housing with the help of the NSP2 consortium. We have got that project back in service, back on the tax roll. Um, very successful. Um, bought it out of foreclosure. Um, We've got a new a new development that we're getting ready to start. You know, towards the to the end of the year, also with our other nonprofit partner, Opalaka CDC. I know I see Dr. Logan over there and Stephanie here in, in the audience, along with some uh, some dollars also from the NSP2 consortium, some dollars from NSP3 through Miami-Dade County, um, some bonds through Pat Brain and, and the HFA. So. So McKinney funds also, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you know we were able to piece a lot of a lot of the funding together. We we worked with Opalaka CDC. We we've created the new TOD district in downtown Opalaka. You know a town that, again, most people would hear and say you're going to do a deal in Opalaka. You know, especially coming off of some of the articles and some of the negative press that you see there. And and and, and again, most people would run the other way. But you know we like to try to make a difference in the communities that we're going to try to build housing in and, and don't shy away from tough deals. You know, we're working on a deal with, I see Danny here from City of Miami Gardens, also a big a deal that was foreclosed upon and we're working there to build some home ownership housing, some rental housing, some commercial development uh, along with their NSP3 program. And then the, the, the one that, that I guess I'm the most proud of there and it's certainly the most difficult one is what we, what we tackled with uh, Public Housing Authority in Miami-Dade County uh, last year, right before the tax credit program uh, was released, you know, Mr. Fortner went out and, 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 and had to take a leap of faith. And the leap of faith was, for the first time, there was money set aside for preservation at the state level to preserve housing that was either Section 8 housing or public housing. And, we all competed, you know, uh, Carlisle also was part of that competition. They were awarded several sites. We were awarded 12 sites at the time, about 23, 2400 units of elderly public housing. Most of the deals are 30, 40 year old projects. Um, we submitted our applications at the state level and we we're fortunate enough to win five deals um, to renovate all these housing. I mean, you, you're talking about 665 units of renovation of public housing um, for all of the residents, which are elderly residents that live on fixed incomes of predominantly 700 to 800 dollars a month of Social Security income, and have to pay 150 or 200 dollars a month of their of their Social Security check to be housed, and the challenge that Miami-Dade County, along with all other PHAs, have is the housing stock's getting older. The capital dollars from the federal government are getting smaller. And how do they meet the housing needs for those families that are on fixed income? So I would say that out of the multitude of partnerships and, and, and different deals that, that we, we've done, I would say that that's certainly probably one of the most creative. And 
Certainly one of the most challenging ones, right, Greg? <laughs> <laughs> it's up to 80 now with the New Deal. All right. It was in the spring of 2009 that a number of us got together to talk about an application to HUD for NSP2 dollars. And it ended up being seven of us and we had no idea when we clicked the button to send that <laughs> application in on July 17, 2009, right, Stephanie? That's right. That, uh, that we, would be, we would receive the sixth largest award in the country and one of the few cons uh, consortia applicants that actually received the exact amount that we asked for, not less. So that, that partnership in that consortium has been amazing in, in all of us learning, actually including uh, our, our friends at HUD because it was all new to them as well. And, and so creating the internal systems to get that volume of housing done in the time period. And I would say we probably all know more about each other than what we really would have preferred. Uh, <laughs> But, but it's been excellent, and, and because we're now just uh, four months away from, from the end of that uh, grant period, we're beginning to look for other uh, things that we can do together now that the system is set up. I want to mention another uh, uh, partnership that has emerged for NHS. I mean, through the Neighborhood Stabilization Program, when, when, it, when it first came out and when we first started looking at it, I was, I was pretty sure that it would have nothing to do with stabilization and it wouldn't be neighborhood based. But uh, there are places around the country where it actually is happening and, it, and there are a number of very creative neighborhood things that are happening here with our uh, grant as well. So when, when you focus so much money in, in one neighborhood and you're able to make some, some impact and some changes, then you start thinking about, well, what, where could we do this again? Where do I get the data to know whether I can do that again? So because of those type of questions, we've created a, a, a very important partnership for us with the Schoenberg Center, and Ann uh, Ray is here from uh, uh, Gainesville, from University of Florida. The Schoenberg Center for Housing Studies have been a great partner for us in, in data uh, uh, across the state, but also here, and we're, we're bringing other partners in to that so that we can do detailed neighborhood assessment of what is going on, not only with what we have done, but bringing other publicly available data in so that we can do that neighborhood assessment. So that's been a great partner. I was gonna do a shout out also for Opalaka, but they've already got way too much praise here. <laughs> uh, Willie and Stephanie will be. Uh, we're doing some uh, additional partnering with them uh, from a planning and regulatory standpoint, and I think that they have done amazing things with, uh, with the Challenge Community Grant from HUD uh, and the other uh, activities these, the, the panelists have talked about. I did want to talk about one regional project, true to my assignment on this panel. Mm -hmm. um, if you think of uh, Northwest 7th Avenue uh, here in Miami-Dade, that's State Road 7 or US 441. It was there before 95. Uh, it was there before the turnpike. It was part of the way we moved up and down the corridor. Uh, it moved on into Broward County, on up into Palm Beach County. Uh, but it, as time went by and the other transportation modes were expanded upon, uh, it became a transportation, economic, and housing uh, corridor uh, that we started to address at the Regional Planning Council with a host of partners uh, over 10 years ago, especially in Broward County, uh, then into Palm Beach, and now with the support of the Miami-Dade County uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization, we're looking at Northwest 7th Avenue uh, here in um, Miami-Dade. The very base of that corridor, the southern end, is the University of Miami's uh, Biotechnology Center in the new health district. 
And I would wonder today if they know, in fact, the DOT has a project plan right out front on their main road. Uh, typically, that we find that often doesn't happen. DOT may be just as big a bureaucracy as, as the housing area. Uh, but we're working uh, with the community redevelopment agencies, with the county, the cities along that corridor, uh, trying to get uh, community-run or community-led uh, development plans along the corridor uh, as DOT moves forward with resurfacing, uh, reconstruction, or even new ramps uh, up on the 95 off of 36 or, or 54th. If you've ever seen a ramp going into an into a, uh, interstate highway, there's a lot of land, a lot of houses that get disturbed. So that's the kind of regional work with a lot of partners uh, that we try to focus on, tying together transportation, housing, and neighborhood economic development. You've all been very innovative with regard to the way you structure your partnerships, the neighborhoods you move into, and the kinds of projects you've taken on. So it's very exciting to hear about that. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how perhaps some of the, the individual projects have had a, a, an effect on the neighborhoods that extends far beyond the housing itself. Well, um, in the case of Habitat, you know, everyone here is very familiar with the housing agents, the, the, the housing industry here, and there was a, um, a very large project, the Scott Carver Homes, which were torn down and Needless to say, it wasn't the, the, the prettiest outcome. Uh, and um, Habitat was brought in, and we were asked to build uh, 57 homes, which we did in a year. These are uh, all in Liberty City in the former Scott Carver. Uh, and in fact, they're so nice, they're in, in your, in your <laughs> brochure as an example of, uh, of lovely, uh, affordable housing. Uh, that had a huge effect uh, in Liberty City. Um, and so, so we're mirroring this with our, we also have NSP2 funds, albeit from Habitat International, we're not part of, of this consortium, and we've created a project called Liberty City Shines, and we focused on the 18th Avenue Corridor, uh, which is also known as Broadway. You know, very few people know we have a Broadway here in, <laughs> in, in South Florida. Unfortunately, Broadway um, had a reputation uh, for lots of drugs, prostitution, uh, not the most savory place. And um, this is where we focused. And we, um, with our partnership with the county and the infill lots, we got uh, dozens of lots off of 18th Avenue, off Broadway, and started putting homes in. And with every single home that you would put in, um, more homeowners would come in and say, okay, we'll, we'll go in there. Uh, at first, it was very difficult to market, and uh, but you know safety and numbers. And now we're up to 40 some homes. Our homeowners are a force to be reckoned with. They have created um, they have created crime watches. They have monthly homeowners meetings, not just for Habitat homeowners, but for residents, uh, where they not only ask the police to come and speak, they demand it. Uh, they have found a voice in safety and numbers. And so Liberty City Shine is a program that we're very proud of and that as we build less, um, we're gonna focus a lot more on community development uh, issues. You know, I always say um, community development is not a marathon. It's, not, it, it's a marathon, not a sprint. It's, it takes a long time and uh, you just have to keep plugging away at it. So we're, we're very proud of that Liberty City Shine. We're starting to see, you know, a couple of little businesses that have opened on 18th Avenue that ha hadn't happened. I'm not taking credit for those, uh, uh, yeah. unless, yeah, <laughs> Why not? not till five o'clock. Uh, <laughs> but definitely, you know, there, it, it, there, there has been an influence. As you bring in families, you're bringing in customers, uh, and you're seeing, you know, where there was um, an element that is not what you wanted um, now you're seeing kids riding bikes on the streets, and uh, has it turned around 100%? No, no. You still see it in the news sometimes, and not for the reasons that you want, but there is a significant impact that can be felt, and the folks in those communities are the first to tell you. And, uh, you know, Opalaka's been getting a lot of, uh, of chatter here, and we also have some lots in Opalaka, and we have been having the challenges of marketing those homes. The way Habitat works is, we don't build a house and then sell it. We have homeowners that come 
Once they start working their sweat equity and they're about two thirds of the way through their sweat equity, they say, okay, this is where I want my home to be built. So we, you know, it's not if you build it, they will come. It's once they're here, we will build it. Uh, and, and I think that that's what's gonna happen in Opalaka too. There's gonna take a couple of urban pioneers uh, and when they see that it's working, we're gonna see a dramatic change in what was known as the Triangle and now it's Magnolia North. Uh, and so we hope to mirror some of the successes uh, in that wonderful community. Next. <laughs> um, we, we too believe that, that although housing is a key component to transforming a community, we need to do more. And, and because of that, in each development that we do, we try to incorporate something different that would really have an impact on the community. Um, we have a credit union in one of our buildings. We have a public library in one of our other buildings. Um, the Verde Gardens project that I was just talking about that has a community organic farm and a farmer's market. And the idea behind that is just is to do more than just plunk down a building. It's really to start really transforming the lives of the community surrounding um, the building that we're developing. And something else that we do that we're really committed to as far as transforming the community is when we develop something, we give priority to the folks that live right in the vicinity of the, of the building that we're building. And that really has had a huge impact in, in transforming blocks of, of the community that we're building in. Um, so for example, for our homeless units, um, we basically give a list to the outreach team that works in that community and we say, you know, you all know who the homeless folks are that are living on these streets here. That's who we want to reserve these units for. And the idea behind that is always really just building the housing for the folks that are living in that community and not bringing folks in from other communities for that housing. And, and that's been really important in our homeless students because as you can imagine when we build a homeless community and we go into a community. For <laughs> you laugh. Huh. No, I, I sympathize <laughs> um, with you. Um, folks get very, very nervous, yeah. um, and when we really, when we sit them down and say, look, this is who we're going to house, which, you know, it's the person that we kind of crossed over in, in walking into this building, um, it, it alleviates a lot of fears, and it's, it's really our commitment back to the community where we're building. Uh, what Stephanie's saying is absolutely right, because on every side of my little townhouse on South Beach is uh, public housing run by the, the Miami Beach Housing Authority, and it gave me a great deal because, uh, you know, people get nervous unnecessarily so because they don't understand, you know, what's going on and how much progress has been made, you know, since, you know, uh, Cabrini Green and, you know, I was able to get a great deal in the townhouse. So it's an unknown marketing strategy <laughs> if you're out there looking for a home in Miami, you know, go find Housing Authority land and just find something next to it. Um, I'm literally on all, si all sides of me except the street in front is, is public housing and it's, uh, it's, it's, a great, it's a great job they've done on Miami Beach with those projects. Um, so we, you know, we're approaching, um, we're approaching the $2 billion in total development cost on the projects we've done in, in seven or eight states. So, you know, and almost all, not almost all of them, a huge majority of them uh, are partnerships with nonprofits, housing authorities, churches, um, and other agencies. And generally they are the impetus for the project and we're picked either through an RFP or, um, or, or somehow procured. So. Um, almost every project I think any of us work on has some major impact on the community in which it's, it's being built beyond just simply housing a certain number of people. Um, one that I'm particularly proud of uh, is the project we did with the YMCA in, in Alapata because it was a specific goal of the, of the organization, n really had nothing to do with creating housing. Their goal was not, hey, we want to house our parishioners or we want to house um, you know, a, a certain income group. Um, it was, we want to try to provide a place for, for these at-risk kids to go after school so that they don't get into trouble and give them a productive outlet. And we want to utilize all these, the ball fields that we have surrounding this piece of land where we have a, an obsolete uh, asset. And the ability to work with them to structure a, a partnership that ultimately allowed them to have 40,000 square feet of brand new space and also that triggered the, the, the inflow of additional investment. The YMCA now had an asset they could campaign for. Bank of America ended up sponsoring the, the learning lab downstairs and other organizations came in. Um, that, those types of, of momentum building, I think, are exactly what you know, Stephanie and Mario are talking about where you know, people have a, you know, they, they're cynical. I mean, the people have, we've all read House of Lies. We all read, you know, read about things going wrong with housing and going wrong, you know, either in the building process or in the management process. Um, and they need to see success. And once they see success, I think they're hungry for it and they jump on board and, and resources come out of the woodwork and, 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 and you know, uh, people you wouldn't believe. The, the step-up program I mentioned earlier is essentially run by contractors 
in South Florida who want to give back to the community. They want to help kids get trained in these areas. They just didn't have a method for doing it. They were never going to come into the game unless someone created an arena for them to contribute their skills. And, and, uh, and I think that's you know the kind of momentum building that Mario is doing on, on Broadway or that Stephanie does in any area where she explains to people that you know homeless housing is not going to ruin their lives and ruin their asset value in their area, but it's going to be a positive for their area. Um, that's the type of thing that, that we all ho hopefully will focus on more and more is what's the, what's the cumulative effect of the project beyond just the number of units that are plunked down on that address. So. Um, m most of, of the developments that, that all of us undertake uh, are, are going to have some type of effect, larger effect on the, on the neighborhoods just by the sheer volume of, of, of dollars that, that are going to be invested into these neighborhoods that even from the smaller scale developments or, you know, of habitat, uh, maybe doing three or four or five lots uh, in, on a block and, or, or to the extent of doing 57, uh, you know, single family homes in, in the Scott Carver area, regardless, even if it's a small development, it's going to be in areas that traditionally and probably for over 10, 20 years have not had any type of new investment in these neighborhoods. And so the nature of what we do automatically creates that excitement um, and that um, you try to leverage that next, the, the next project, the next uh, developer, the next funding source to, to say, well, maybe I'll take a, a, a leap of faith and do a deal in Opalaka. Um, so we, we are um, inherently in a position to, to make change in, in the neighborhoods that, that, that we build on. Um, and, and I mentioned a lot of the, the partnerships earlier, so I, th I think all of them to a different level have their own uh, effect on a larger neighborhood. You know, I know one of the ones that we're just getting ready to start is it's our smallest development, but, but it's, 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 a, it's a, uh, an old 1925 building. It's, it's, it, it had two fires. It's been sitting vacant for three or four years. It's sitting next to an elementary school in the middle of Havana. In a, in a predominantly residential single family neighborhood. And it's, you know, again, it seems like a small project, and it is. It's our smallest project from, from a unit standpoint. It's 34 units, but that, that project is going to make a difference in that neighborhood, and that it was part of the neighborhood stabilization program. We're obviously going to be able to house very extremely low income seniors in, in the building, but more importantly, you're going you're gonna to create a brand new. Uh, building or restore a, a building that was a significant building from a historic standpoint sitting next to an elementary school that was just renovated and you have this eyesore next ne next next to the school so the all of our projects have a, a big effect in in the neighborhoods that that we work in Arden and Jim get to be the last respondents to my question before we open it up to the audience okay well we've had uh, a community and neighborhood involvement directly in, in two s smaller neighborhoods, uh, Brownsville and Gladeview in unincorporated North Miami-Dade. And um, th th so we've, we've done REO acquisition and repair and sale, done new houses. We've done our volunteer day uh, painting and landscaping homes owned by low-income families. We've done leadership training We've done, we've worked with neighborhood associations and uh, uh, other partners in those neighborhoods. And the, 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 that kind of concentrated effort in a fairly small neighborhood is necessary and we need to all do more of that. The tying back to the data comment that I made earlier, we uh, before we started building, it, we, we got a small piece of land to do 27 houses in the, the Gladeview area. But before we started construction, we did a, a market study so that we had some idea whether we could actually sell these houses or not. And it's interesting that the market study came back saying that there were really two markets overlaid on top of each other in those neighborhoods that included most of Brownsville, Gladeview, much of Liberty City, and the south part of West Little River. 
that the older homes that are two bedroom, one bath, that are 40, 50, 60 years old, uh, were selling, and this was uh, done about a year ago, were selling for about 65 to 70,000. The new houses, that many of whom, many of which had a second mortgage from Miami-Dade County that were three bedroom, two bath, were selling for about 165 to 170. All this in the same neighborhood, on the same blocks. And so we knew then that we could sell those houses. And in fact, while the houses are still under construction, most of them have buyers contracted already. Well, as you've discerned, we don't do projects per se, but we do do plans. And I must say, we're probably guilty in the past of doing plans, the proverbial plans that ended up on the shelf and nobody took any look at them or did anything about them or did they lead to any implementation. But recently, um, we, we were faced with an opportunity uh, to take a plan that we have produced every five years, as a regional strategic economic plan, which we do for the United States Economic Development Administration. And we, could, we decided we would approach this much differently uh, and reach out to partners that we had not normally reached out to and actually prepare the plan in a format which was totally inconsistent with what a government agency would have done in the past. The format really came from the Florida Chamber of Commerce Foundation. Uh, they have developed a template for doing strategic economic development planning, which they call Six Pillars. Uh, and they have used it and they deal with their partner uh, economic organizations around the state. But we thought as a government agency, it would change the dynamics uh, if we went ahead and said, let's partner with the chamber. Let's see how they approach it from a planning standpoint. Use their language, their metrics, their uh, data, and build upon that uh, as we work forward doing the next five-year update. In turn, we uh, reached out to the uh, Beacon Council in Miami-Dade County and the uh, Greater Fort Lauderdale Alliance. They were both doing their updating their plans. And together, we worked with the Florida Chamber Foundation. We're now, again, using the same language, the same matrix. And uh, so what does that all mean for you? Well, I think probably for the first time in the Beacon Council plan and in the Greater Fort Lauderdale Alliance plan and in the plan developed by the South Florida Regional Planning Council, there's a very strong statement about affordable housing being absolutely important for economic development of the region. And I don't think we would have done that if we had developed the plan the way we did it five years ago, if we had uh, looked for the appropriate uh, framework and, and direction and the rules that uh, had come from either Washington or Tallahassee. I think that's the kind of situation we're all in these days. We're ready to throw off some of the old modes of operating, get new partners, and find ways to advance affordable housing and, and economic development. I want to wanna thank you all. We definitely want to set aside a little bit of time for audience Q&A. If there are any questions out there, just please raise your hand. Yeah, we certainly want to acknowledge the students that are here, and if, if, I'd like to give the first opportunity to students that may have questions. Hi, my name is Dan Clement. I'm a master's student in geography at the University of Miami. Um, I was hoping you, anyone on stage, could speak about the relationship between mass transit, public transportation, and the development of workforce housing. Sure, yeah, uh, you know, we just finished, a, um, I think, our sixth mass transit public-private partnership with Miami-Dade County Transit Agency. And um, this is one of those examples that Al and I have sort of harped on of, you know, just a low-hanging fruit. I mean, the agency has, has a desire to see ridership increased. We all have a desire to see cars taken off the road, which reduces carbon footprint. It reduces people's commute time. Um, and for our residents, it's actually a bigger savings to avoid having a car than, than really even the, the reduction in the rent that we can provide in a typical tax credit unit. So. You know, the, the hard part was not coming up with the idea. In fact, a lot of other states and agencies had sort of pioneered these public-private partnerships. Um, it, it wasn't even convincing the folks at, at Miami-Dade Transit this was a good idea and it would benefit them. It was figuring out how do you move from everyone wanting to do something to a $100 million building sitting on top of a federal, uh, federally funded piece of land that was not funded for affordable housing. It was funded to, to create a parking lot for the next 50 years. And, and um, 
the, the results have been absolutely phenomenal. There's, there, there's um, I think Arden mentioned, there's sometimes there are feedback loops that you sort of have a vague idea of, but you don't really know what the feedback loop is gonna be until you actually are in the ground and you have real data. Uh, the ridership has more than doubled on those transit lines, um, which is something we somewhat expected. What we didn't realize is by doubling the ridership, Miami-Dade Transit, which could use a dollar or two, has had access to, tr to additional grant funding because they're seeing upticks in their ridership, which is what the national transit folks want to see. They could care less that the ridership happens to come from great, you know, lead certified housing or we have little electric car charging ports downstairs so people can share electric cars in the future and all these great things. They just are happy to see more riders. So there's these feedback loops that are out there and I think there are more and more complicated feedback loops um, that need to be tapped into, whether it's between, you know, uh, um, single family home ownership opportunities and, and rental or different income strata, as Stephanie mentioned, or different, different organizations. But mass transit, by virtue of their size and by the amount of square footage they control in any urban area, should be the first stop on anyone's, no pun intended, first stop on anyone's list. But I'm pumped. I would add one. We'll be here all week. I would add one additional thing, and that is, while this is far from being official, there are some underwriters at banks that are beginning to look at a combination of, of housing and transportation cost as a significant factor in underwriting for a mortgage. By the way, I don't want to, I don't want to harp on this, but there have probably been, I'd say between just the groups up here, probably a couple hundred million dollars in transit-oriented public-private partnership developments built in Miami. We are clearly, Miami is clearly the leader throughout the state and throughout the southeast, and I would say rivals some of the cities that we often hold ourselves up to as Miamians in, in comparison. One thing we don't do a good job of, and I don't have an answer for why this is, is we just don't give ourselves the credit. We don't, we don't publicize our wins. You know, I think if you walk down Broadway, be careful, do it during the day, um, in, you know, in Miami, and you ask people about housing, you know, you're going to hear about House of Lies, and you're going to hear about, you know, this, you know, you're going to hear about how expensive the condos are, and you're going to hear all these negative things. What you don't hear about are the successes of, of Miami-Dade public housing, or the successes of, 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 you know, a lot of different parts of the Miami government and private sector working together. You know, half a billion dollars of transit-oriented public-private partnership in less than a decade is a real win, but we don't do a good job of publicizing our wins the way a lot of other cities do, and I, I hope that'll change because that's part of what's missing from the dialogue is, is focusing on some of these big successes. Ralph, I'd just like to add that I, I want to uh, second that nomination in Miami-Dade is the real leader, uh, but regionally there's an opportunity for all the folks interested in this issue uh, to get engaged with both the, the Tri-Rail Authority, the South Florida Regional Transportation Authority, and our transportation department, because they're busy today spending our, our tax dollars planning TOD stations on the Florida East Coast Railroad line. That's the one that, you know, the traditional Flagler line that carries just freight today. And with all that planning going on and, and focusing in with the local governments and the community redevelopment agencies, you know, they're, they're trying to focus on TODs. And it might not have been anything more than planning until Florida East Coast Industries said, oh, by the way, we're going to invest a billion dollars and build our own railroad to carry traffic from here to Miami. That was a key infrastructure decision by the private side, which is going to make all those plans that we're doing for TOD in Broward and Palm Beach and in Dade uh, closer to coming to reality. I think we have time for just one more question. So you're all... I think making it sound too easy. <laughs> then we didn't do it right. right. <laughs> um, and, the, and the one surprising news, one of the most surprising things I've heard this afternoon is that NIMBYs are no longer the number one issue. Um, I've been part of com two committees over the years that looked at inclusive zoning or a way to better mix um, different types of housing together. And the definition we heard in the beginning was about, included the word proximity. Mm -hmm. So um, given what we've heard up to now, is it time for this committee to meet uh, for the third time? Is inclusive, zone, is inclusive zoning trying to mix even more than you have already succeeded a goal that we should set before us? You know, not to be, not to joke, but I, I think NIMBY isn't still an issue. It's just that the NIMBYs are now running the state government. 
So, <laughs> you know, we, we don't have to deal with the neighborhood NIMBYs. We have to deal with folks when we go up to Tallahassee who say, I'm in Orlando. This doesn't really, you know, your, your, your issues don't really bother me very much. I really don't see the reason to spend any money, you know, on affordable housing and, and the trust funds that were, you know, taxed for and set aside for affordable housing are being, you know, spent on other things. So it's not that uh, NIMBY is an education issue and it's not that there's not a huge education gap in terms of the impact of, you know, all the projects you've heard today. I just think that, the, you know, the, the NIMBYs have now occupied a much higher post than, you know, Heckler from the audience in a, in a zoning hearing. Um, in, in terms of inclusionary zoning, um, you know, that's, you're much better equipped, I think, in some ways to answer that. It's a, the argument I've heard and I, I, I you know, my own interests aside, the argument I've heard is that it imposes an additional cost on the developer and, 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 and it's not unlike saying, well, we really need our more sources. You know, it's just the source in this case is coming from in a more distributed tax base, which is every new development. And I've heard every argument about, well, you know, we're just developers, why are you taxing us? Why don't you tax dentists? Or why don't you tax, you know, bus fares or something else? Um, and I think, you know, my hope is new sources are always welcome, as I think everyone here has said, sources welcome. But, um, but, but as, as Al mentioned to me, you know, in a sidebar, we have the sources. Surprisingly, we have the sources. What we don't have are ways to connect the sources efficiently. That that's my, would be more my focus. Yeah, and, and to expand on that, the, the, the inclusionary zoning model obviously has to be, um, there's a lot of moving parts to it. And, and again, it, it's, and everyone up here is obviously pro affordable housing and pro, pro workforce housing. However, it, to me, in my mind, it's kind of one of those, you know, regulations like, like everything, you have to think through all of the ramifications of it and what unintended consequences can come from those inclus inclusionary zoning uh, restrictions rather than maybe letting the projects and, and the professionals that are more involved in the development of that product for inclusionary zoning to, to do what they do versus, you know, a, a, a somewhat of a regulatory mandate, you know, and, and again, even, even in, in we're, we're proponents of affordable housing, but I, even I have my own reservations from a regulatory standpoint of the pros and cons of inclusionary zoning. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Daniela Levine, Catalyst Miami. So this is the part of the discussion that is most um, relevant to my work and something that I know a little bit more about. And I just want to underscore the importance of having community-wide discussions about these issues, uh, not only um, to deal with some of the barriers, but frankly because inclusionary zoning and mixed income housing have been demonstrated to be among the most effective anti-poverty strategies in the country today. So in fact, the very future of our nation and the deconcentration of poverty are very dependent upon the success of these programs. So I, I just feel that that is not well understood. So the urgency of it is not well understood. And hearing about the great progress that's being made, I just think we should take up Liz on her invitation to, to move forward with some ongoing dialogue about how we can further leverage this. Yeah, I just want to clarify. I don't think any, either of us are saying we're against inclusionary zoning oh, no, or no. anything like that. I just think no. inclusionary zoning is a change to the regulatory framework. Reducing right. silos is a change to the regulatory framework. Both of them are going to be long and painful processes and involve right. a fair number of community meetings and, 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 and strategy meetings. Um, the pro the, I would say the, the thing to keep in mind is that when you sit with a group of folks, I think like Greg and his staff who've worked to try to move, or, or Armando, to move some of these barriers out of the way, I think you shook your head when someone said none of these rules, some of these rules haven't been looked at in 40 years. Not his fault, and he's working to try to clear some of that dead wood away. You at least don't have anyone sitting on the other side with a well-funded campaign to obstruct. Whereas I think if you come forward with a plan that says, listen, and again, this is not me, but there is a tax being imposed and there's somebody whose ox is being gored and that somebody is every guy who wants to build a brand new luxury high rise in Miami. It just imposes a, a friction 
in, in, from an opposing party that I think in this town is going to make it very hard for us to, uh, you know, I don't know that I'll live to see the day, although I'm certainly willing to sit on the pro side like I did for, you know, uh, um, you know, the urban development boundary, you know, I mean, there, there weren't a lot of other developers who were sitting on the pro side of that one. So I think we struggle if, if, as a community if we say, oh, the only way we're going to fix this is inclusionary zoning and let's leave those regulatory hurdles in place. I think that's a faster road to, to freeing up some sources. We're going we're gonna to need to wrap up here. Sure. This is an excellent con discussion. We'll continue it uh, after the next panel. Let's thank our great panelists and our moderator. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for participating in the conference today, and, and even more than that, thank you all for the work that you do each and every day on behalf of South Florida's families.